Since I would wipe out if I tried to address modernism directly, I will avoid it uh, and let you all put in uh, uh, the talk into the context of modernism as it was beautifully articulated this morning. Um, I will let that the ism on the first wave roll by, sort of. Uh, the, try writing the second, and I probably will um, wipe out on the third. Uh, the three points that I have departure that I want to offer um, are reject the tabula rasa, oppose form for form's sake, and question name brand masterpieces. The three attempts at arrival will be work with the existing, design a process, not a thing, and find the untitled landscape. The notion of beginning uh, design with a cleared site or not a site at all um, has been challenged for a long time. And even though we've seen specific site-specific examples of uh, modernism, uh, there was, and I think still, work that ignores site in favor of creating ideals, uh, idealized form. When another generation um, acknowledged that site matters, site specificity became paramount for those who could relinquish per pure formalism. Articulated by artists like Robert Irwin, another way of working was described as site generated. And this, I believe, has led to a further iteration of, um, of design, method uh, of design, wholly, that is wholly site dependent. In this case, design is contingent upon giving form more aptly gaining form as a result of finding the forces within a site, past and present. Site, de uh, site, design de um, site dependent design is provisional, at best um, anticipating the future. Having rejected the tabula rasa, the multiple histories of a site has become the focus of many designers' work. In particular, the social and ecological la layers piled high in post-industrial and urbanized landscapes that are a product of modernization. My own obsession with the landscapes of modernism originates in New Jersey from rides in our family station wagon with too many siblings along the New Jersey uh, turnpike past the refineries, this was nature for me, uh, to visit my dad, a plastic salesman that worked on the 44th floor of the Chrysler building. And when any of us would get lost, he'd say, I'll meet you at the Lever House. So at 10 years old, I knew to tell the cab, Lever House, please. And of course, uh, being tr uh, true Jersey girl, um, I continue to try to walk in Smithson's footsteps to find the complexity within conflicted landscapes and to conceive of a way of working where pure form just won't cut it. That especially in the case of industrial sites, a design response emerges from particular material flows and methods of making, along with the traces of the people that work there or are working there that forms a very specific, if not a peculiar, landscape. If modernists love the forms that are a result of modernization, like Corbu equating cars with machines for living, then I prefer writing whatever wave it is that is grounded in the working landscape itself, along with um, a landscape with the people who made the machines. Working landscapes have produced social machines for living where now we are left with sites full of traces of human agency. Along with Rivera's um, murals, Scheeler's painting of the Ford River Rouge plant positions the industrial landscape in a cultural context that simply won't allow us to cast away the ambitious imprints left by labor. So what are the implications for des a design method of working with the post-industrial landscape? Post-industrial landscapes are far from being a blank slate. The stuff contained within in them, for better and for worse, is too good to wipe clean. Clearing or covering over these sites obliterates embedded histories. This image, by the way, is of the River Rouge, where I got to collaborate with a very dear friend and colleague, um, brilliant colleague, Thomas Woltz. He and I um, had to convince, shockingly enough, that um, the River Rouge was a cultural landscape and that it was a working landscape that offered an incredibly sublime scale to work with, the sublime scale being the generations of uh, folks that live there. 
uh, worked there, practically lived there. Um, and that this was a landscape not to be domesticated. All manufactured sites represent complex systems, ones that shouldn't be overlooked nor oversimplified. Really, these landscapes can be considered already designed, and only a fool would think they could design something better. Working with these layered sites suggests a method to unearth and reveal, and then add a layer with restraint of allowing contradictions to arrive and amplifying the complexity of the existing landscape with simple means. This way of working with the existing means entering into a design process with little, if any, preconceptions of what the final outcome might be. Um, in working at the Urban Outfitters um, headquarters uh, at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, it was um, uh, Urban Outfitters decided to um, uh, bring everybody out of the uh, crowded buildings around Rittenhouse Square and occupy um, four very large buildings um, at the Navy Yard. Um, and so now their uh, very creative crew um, at the first phase, 700, it's now doubled in size, um, got to occupy, um, although they didn't like moving out of downtown, to the historic core of the Philadelphia Navy Yard, which once actually was a, a, a civic access uh, down South Broad to the Delaware River, although the stadiums now have kind of cut off that uh, civicness. Um, and I hope that gets um, uh, reinforced more in the future. But given the combo of industrial and commercial and uh, residential work, it could, um, uh, could go bad um, pretty quickly and become bad suburban mush. But it can't become mush if you pay attention to its history as an island, an isolated piece of land turned factory, turning out incredible numbers of ships. Um, with half of the base remaining active, which it is, um, it was a curious task to think about um, a fashion reel teller um, fa uh, setting up um, shop for, um, uh, to design dresses. Um, actually, it couldn't have been a better assignment. Um, the scale of the ship still moored there. This is right outside a building um, where the Urban Outfitters um, employees work. Uh, not to mention the planes roaring overhead about every 10 minutes, um, but all the more reason to take cues from the traces of production already there that built these floating beasts. Um, it was clear uh, that it would have to, as Adrian Hoja would say, be built like a motherfucker. Um, but in fact, it already was, so now it just had to be rebuilt. Um, here were centuries of hard labor, of craft, of hundreds of men and women working with wood and steel on expanses of concrete. Below that crust of rust was a boatload of embodied energy, um, off, which offered an amazing amount of energy to work with, um, to make a new place for hundreds of men, mostly women, uh, to work again. With the legacy of craft, uh, the new layer of fashion was a pretty groovy juxtaposition. Uh, we were depending upon the site uh, to keep that creativity alive. So there really were no preconceptions of what the site would become until we started working on um, what, uh, uh, what the fit between Urban Outfitters and the yard would be um, by um, really uh, agreeing with the client that it would be simply organized according to how um, uh, that place once operated. Um, and there was no real site plan. Um, it was uh, just a strategy of uh, working with what we found. So we started with forensics looking for what we guessed might be underneath. There was one archaeological swath behind me um, that we discovered there could be um, good stuff under there, um, under a very thin crust of asphalt. Uh, I'm directing um, a demolition contractor, driving him absolutely crazy. Um, telling him that he wasn't demolishing, but he was salvaging precious stuff. We stockpiled all of that um, debris that would normally go off to a landfill and then began lovingly refashioning it. And of course, um, since we were working with a big brand, we had to brand it. Um, and then although um, uh, Urban Outfitters, the founder, really only cared about what 
this, um, what anything looked like, um, the site was still turned into a sponge. I kind of managed to um, get any of those issues snuck in the back door. So it's pretty simple. It was really simple, actually. The asphalt was scraped off to reveal the tracks. The chunks of concrete got um, pretended to be really expensive pavers. Um, and uh, Barney Rubble was even more popular than ever uh, with imprints of centuries of work. Um, free people emerged, and we added kind of goofy, frilly, little pink flowering trees on top of the tough stuff just for fun. Uh, more and more, um, uh, with second uh, consequent phases, we uh, unearthed more on the site um, and added up to repiling more layers of history. And then we were able to add another family member. And uh, Betty uh, was used as mulch under um, hundreds and hundreds of feet of hedgerows that protect the west side of um, enormous buildings. Um, so then looking again at this historic uh, photograph, um, you know, you just look like what, at what might be underneath the asphalt. And so in essence, when we began to work around the dry dock, it was again already designed. So unearthing um, the crane way was great. I was like, well, it's designed, thanks, done. Uh, can I still have my fee? Um, and, and that simply, um, and that that crane way simply became uh, the promenade. Hopefully it'll be dirty pink uh, once people mess it up. Um, and the space that was um, once occupied by the giant crane is now um, open to the public, um, at least on weekdays, um, hopefully more than that, uh, to moving people. Um, the arabesque uh, um, pattern of rails, uh, was something that uh, was simply projected up. Um, and yes, this is form, <laughs> but only from finding the form um, and, the, um, and now uh, immersing bodies and bikes um, in what will be um, enormously tall, wild, wild and woolly plants. Um, and yes, I will still confess my addiction to form, but also uh, the ecological function of floating wetlands um, and yes, I admit of being a complete slut, um, smelling out urban, uh, which is visible from the plains landing in Philly. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> um, but here we go. I like to think we did, maybe did a little bit better than Stern's master plan, as lovely as it appears. It is just that. It's a master plan. And I do like to think that maybe the uh, DIRT plan um, is not a master plan, but a recording of the action plan. De decades ago, uh, the idea of form emerging from the landscape processes became a central design methodology. Process-based design introduced the idea of open-ended landscapes, but it also got confused with making stylized shapes pretending to be the result of dynamic systems. What if the idea of site-dependent design went a step further to suggest a course of action instead of proposing any given form at all? that as a designer you propose a strategy of setting processes in motion, a strategy where it's uncertain what the ultimate form the landscape will take, and it's ambiguous who in that process will be giving um, uh, that landscape form. Approaching a lands uh, project that may begin with, say, a post-urbanized landscape like this, um, sorry, that's uh, Griffian's um, uh, photograph, um, of Detroit, uh, it's very difficult for a client or community to trust what they can't see without a site plan. Uh, but in the end, it's about their participation in giving their landscape shape. Embracing this idea of not designing with form but with action does not mean pulling the fabulous Saarinen chair out from under us, um, but to suggest another way of working since I own a sarin and womb chair, uh, and to fill Charles's request, I am obligated here to share autobiographical track back to go ahead and contradict myself some more and to track my own rejection of form for form's sake. 
Um, allow me for a minute to look back on how, as an art student in Pittsburgh, again, a trash city, <laughs> nature, um, I crafted things. Um, I made objects like any good sculptor is supposed to do. And I admired the minimalists like Judd and Andre and all those hip white guys. But I was drawn more to the post-minimalist work of Ava Hesse. Intuitively, I was uh, in, by, inspired by her more messy evocations of pure form. And rare photo of my work from 1980. Uh, there was a moment when I got totally disenchanted with making objects um, and only made parts to create installations focused on the viewer's experience. I was still in love with form, but began using it toward a different end. And then I was inspired to leave the gallery altogether, following in the footsteps of artists like Heiser, Matta Clark here, and my hero, Smithson. I wanted to work with a broader context with a lot more complexity. When I finally got out of my black hole that occurred between studying art and uh, deciding that landscape architecture might be a good idea to look into, um, I was thrown into, uh, uh, I went to uh, the GSD and was thrown into an, a very intense group. Um, Uncle Pete and Aunt Martha, the big LO, Boy, jo Boy George, and Super Smart Beth. When I finally, uh, I really gravitated toward my primary mentor, Michael Van Volkenberg, or simply Michael. Michael instilled a passion for the medium of the landscape, pointing towards the work of modernists like Kylie, Rose, and uh, Steele. As a recovering sculptor, I was very excited about Michael's experiments with ice as a form of working with a medium that only allowed a best guess. And I still appreciate the emphasis of using form, not purely for form's sake, but for the participant's immersion into the experience of the landscape. In working with Michael at his firm, I came to appreciate that, the, that strong forms, as uh, ones as mundane as a basketball court, were used in the service of landscape experience. What was being revealed about the particular site and how the amplification of latent qualities within that landscape was the trigger to powerful associations at the scale of the body, while also evoking the response in relationship for a person in relationship to the larger environment. Uh, continuing to learn from Michael and my other young mentor, Matt Urbanski, who joined MVVA, I aspire to engage in a process of call and response with the site a type of call and response where the participant would engage in their own conversation with the site, where people can simply find their place within a complex space, trusting, in a way, a person's capacity to interact with a landscape where chance and change were, are the primary um, uh, forces. So this brings me back to current musings about how the call and response in the process of design could extend maybe further to a call and response in the process of actually making of the landscape in real time, where a strategy for landscape form to emerge is the thing to design. Um, a symptom of uh, Dirt Studios' madness stems from a concern of how, um, uh, one, manufactured sites can obviously threaten the health of communities, but also, two, how with less toxic sites, the means by which they are reclaimed has the questionable consequences, the, uh, one of those being the way dirty dirt um, is not dealt with in an open and transparent way. And returning again to the issue of so many conflicted sites and situations that they get glazed over by idealized or generic images of landscape. And at dirt, we try to find where the rub is and take on working with unknowns or contradictions that there's a way of orchestrating the process of landscape regeneration that you can promote a productive and healthy friction. So this is a collaborative um, project um, with the artist Mel Chin and also um, scientists, which I think will be interesting if we start naming those scientists by name, Dr. Howard Milkey. Um, and a group of UVA students who um, have uh, actually pushed uh, the work 
um, in incredible ways and contributed so much to this uh, project that was about addressing the incredibly high levels of um, lead in uh, soils. The EPA um, accepted level um, is 400 parts per million. Oh geez, I'm gonna go quick. Um, and that the lead map, um, and that there might be unsafe buildings, but there was also unsafe ground. And that the idea was just, just to treat, lock, and cover. And we were not designing side yards, um, but we were um, uh, designing the method in which they would be uh, remediated. The one of the key ingredients was uh, sediment from the spillway. We calculated how many need to go into neighborhoods. And we created this network from extra large to extra small sites that um, folks could come and get the active ingredients to remediate their soils. So it went from an extra large depot to a mud square to a neighborhood yard. Um, I'm gonna skip through this next thing that's about 9-11 and because it's in a way too sad, but it's more about a process than making a place and this idea of um, having healthy dirt and uh, healthy trees parade um, into neighborhoods um, of people who worked at the, um, at the World Trade Center. Perhaps the third wave of modernism is the post-industrial tsunami that has left us with the vast terrain of urban wilderness. Many writers and filmmakers like Vim Vendors and photographers along with landscape theorists and designers have recognized these urban voids or Turan Vogue as the byproduct of modernization oddly essential to our contemporary urban culture. These vast spaces plague cities but they are also the next place that could and should be taken on by landscape architects. But bringing huge tracts of abandoned land can't possibly be designed in a normative way. In fact, practically and even conceptually, it doesn't make sense for these wild places to be designed with a capital D. A place that isn't obviously designed doesn't mean operating without a conscious and intentional design decisions. It simply suggests that finding the form of a landscape growing on its own term is a legitimate act of design. Descriptions of these messy places are less form-based. The constructed path is besides the point. The evocations summon more qualitative adjectives. The rattiness is what matters. One could use a lot of verbs in past, present, and future terms if all those layers were revealed by design. Smithson recognized creating work is primarily about the concrete act of casting a glance that seeing the contradictory forces within conflicted landscapes like urban wilds can't take any certain form. He wrote, nature for the dialectician is indifferent to any formal idea. Undoubtedly, it takes a keen eye to see the form in seemingly formless landscapes, but then there is the anonymous nature of that glance. The idea that the landscape is simply brought into view might very well be authorless, not a name brand, untitled, but still, hey, by a really great artist. I do know that I run the risk of sounding bitter about losing competition, but it's too important to reconsider the questions raised by the challenge to imagine the future of this extraordinary landscape. I was only a small part of a team assembled by MVVA who conceptually led a group committed to designing strategies, not things, to reveal this already incredibly beautiful landscape. Um, where was I? Uh, it was already there. I got the two-minute thing. Uh, it was already there. It became a matter of how we did as um, how li little we did as designers, but how much we could enable people to cast that knowing glance. The found wilderness of the High Line was a landscape that Team Terragram described as quote demonstrating its own ecological logic without aesthetic meddling that it draws life and purpose from what exists. The worry was that too much aestheticizing could run the danger of anesthetizing. Form matters, but only as much as time and chance do. The trick seems to be figuring out where to step in to the process to call attention or to signal intention, but also when to step in, um, not step in. Um, sure, it may be naive to think that just a glance and little else would be possible to preserve, but willfully preserve a really messy urban wilderness. Unfortunately, there are more landscapes like these that aren't getting the attention or the budget. This is the territory that needs this, that second glance. Minimizing giving form to a landscape 
may call into question what is labeled landscape architecture. Taking on derelict um, terrain requires claiming spaces that aren't tagged for design yet. These ratty sites are nothing new. Clearly, they, uh, they all can't be central parks, but you have to always ask, what would dead Fred do? Oops, sorry. That was, where was Fred? Anyway, you probably saw it. There it is. These orphan landscapes will require this other way of working that I don't think we have figured out yet. What if these landscape, how about if these wild landscapes could be a different kind of park, a landscape with no title and without an author? This is our urban frontier. How about a gnarly site that earns badges for providing us with a messy experience of complex productive um, cycles of growth and decay? This is our iconic landscape. How about an urban wilderness worth visiting at the overgrown edges in every modernized city? This is our national park. Thank you.